with coverage you can count on. With coverage you can count on, this is Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 6 in HD. Thanks for watching the news at 6. I'm David Carroll. And I'm Cindy Sexton. And we begin tonight with a developing story out of Marion County. As we reported at 5 o'clock this afternoon, a death investigation is underway at Lake Nickajack. The Marion County Sheriff's Office found a body in Nickajack Lake about 2 o'clock this afternoon. We'll get right to Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Sarah Sidery, who joins us live now from the scene. And she'll be, she'll be talking with us in just a little bit. Now, we will check back in with her having a couple difficulties at the moment. But once again, that is an ongoing investigation of a body found there at Nickajack Lake in Marion County. Also this evening, a family is seeking closure after the death of their family member and Bradley County inmate Billy Joe Rogers. Now, Rogers was found unresponsive in a cell in April. Officials say he had gotten into a fight with another inmate. He was taken to Erlanger, where he died a couple of days later. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Tanisha Cordell has more information for us. Tanisha. Well, Cindy, it's been nearly eight months since Rogers' death, and the family says they still haven't gotten the answers they need. It's an everyday thing. We, we don't know. They won't talk to us, so we want answers. I mean, that's basically all we want is the truth. Billy Joe Rogers, older sister Ann Clower, and the rest of the Rogers family met at the Bradley County Courthouse, still searching for answers, starting with the reason for Rogers' arrest. He shouldn't have been in jail. No. He did, he did not commit a crime, but he died in jail. We know that for a fact. Rogers was arrested for a warrant on failure to appear. He was being held until a scheduled court hearing. Reports later revealed Rogers was found unresponsive in a jail cell after an altercation with another inmate. He later died at the hospital. We heard it was over food, over food, but they need to tell us why, how and why. The autopsy report shows Rogers died because of blunt force injuries to his head. It also shows other injuries. Look at every bone in his body that was broke from head to toe. And ask me, how could you go on if it was your brother? Just last week, there was another Bradley County inmate death investigation where three officers were indicted for failing to perform checks and falsifying jail logs in the September death of Ralph Nelms. The Rogers family attorney, John Wolf, says it's time to answer their questions, too. There's already been indictments. There's already been things in the paper about it. The death has been explained. Uh, all the answers are there for that family. I believe, or at least, you know, the They're basic answers people. are there. But here, you know, this is eight months and nothing. I mean, the disparity is just, is just inexplicable. Months, the family says, feels like a lifetime as they continue to search for closure. Now, the family says they've reached out to the sheriff's office and the district attorney's office numerous times, though both parties tell me they're unaware of any calls or emails. District attorney Steve Crump says they, he plans on reaching out to the family as soon as possible. Crump also says it's important to understand that each investigation is totally separate and each has its own timetable. In the studio, Tanisha Cordell, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Tanisha. 39-year-old Billy Joe Rogers' death is the third death at the Bradley County Jail this year. In March, the TBI investigated the death of 53-year-old inmate Herschel Dover. Officials later determined Dover died of natural causes. Ralph Nelms was found dead in his cell in September. The TBI says correctional staff found him hanging in his cell. And the TBI says Nelms was on suicide watch at the time of his death, meaning correctional staffers were required to check on him periodically and document that. Investigators say the former correctional officers, Gabriel Black, Ronald Reddish, and Timothy Boyd, were responsible for those checks but failed to carry them out. Instead, they were told they forged the jail logs to show visits they didn't actually make. All three officers have been indicted for official misconduct. You can read details of those inmate deaths on our website, wrcbtv.com. 
Now back to that developing story out of Marion County where a death investigation is underway at Nickajack Lake. The Marion County Sheriff's Office found a body in Nickajack Lake about two this afternoon. Let's go to Sarah Sidery. She joins us live now from the scene. Sarah. Well, David and Cindy, two fishermen who were fishing near the I-24 bridge uh, discovered the man's body, which had floated near the shoreline around 2 o'clock this afternoon. Deputies uh, used a boat to recover the body and uh, transported the body to Hales Bar Marina around 3.30 this afternoon. Uh, the body has been transported to Nashville for an official autopsy to determine the cause of death. At this point, investigators aren't sure if this was an accidental drowning or if foul play was involved, but they are asking the public's help um, for the public's help if they notice any suspicious activity or if they uh, notice that anyone has gone missing to give them a call. Um, again, anyone with information should contact the Marion County Sheriff's Office. Reporting live, Sarah Sidery, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Sarah. City officials in Chattanooga announced they will contribute a million dollars toward the construction of the new Children's Hospital in honor of the families impacted by the Woodmore bus tragedy. Children's Hospital at Erlanger cared for the children injured in the bus crash on November 21st. Mayor Andy Burke says the city will commit the money over the next four years. In addition, the city will work with the hospital and the Woodmore families to determine how to recognize those impacted by the bus crash. A Chattanooga woman stabbed her boyfriend and tried to set the room on fire. 25-year-old Lorea Drew is charged with aggravated arson and aggravated assault in connection with the incident that happened on Dodson Avenue Tuesday. 34-year-old Edward Thornton told police Drew stabbed him and tried to burn down his room. Officers arrested Drew less than half a mile from the home. This is the second time Drew has been charged was setting fire to Thornton's property. Police say Drew set a fire to a pile of his clothing in a yard and then left the house with her child inside back in August. In Dalton, the police department is investigating a recent wave of graffiti. Police say the unlawful paintings have shown up on old storefronts and building walls in the area of Fifth Avenue and Long Street. Gang unit investigators don't believe it has anything to do with gangs. If you have any information about the vandalism, what it means, or who's behind it, call the Dalton Police Department. While most businesses are winding down for the holidays, it is crunch time for the U.S. Postal Service. Wow, it sure is. The deadlines to get packages shipped in time for Christmas have passed. Now, today is the busiest day for the mail carriers attempting to deliver them. Channel 3's Kelly McCarthy joined one mail carrier today and shows us just how this is the most hectic time of the year. Just three days from Christmas and today is said to be the biggest package delivery day of the year. I followed along with one mail carrier as he's racing the clock to make sure everything gets delivered on time. Kip Kaufman says he's been mentally preparing for this day. One of the busiest days of his career. You know, when you walk in and see the piles of packages and the, the mounds of mail, it, it gets a little overwhelming. USPS says 30 million packages will be delivered Thursday across the country. Some of those right here on Oak Street. I've got about 80 packages today to deliver. Um, that doesn't sound like very many, but most of my route is, is walking. With each step, Kaufman walks more than eight miles a day, carrying up to 70 pounds in packages. It's a physically demanding job, but he says it's worth it after each delivery. The uh, excitement of seeing someone looking for that package and, and you're able to bring that to them and it, it makes their day. They're looking forward to something and you're the one bringing it to them. It's a responsibility Kaufman honors, making sure each package is safely delivered to the right spot. Especially putting them out of sight so you know, someone doesn't come up on the porch and steal them, unfortunately. So, you know, we try to be mindful of those things and, and keep it safe for our customers. And even though he started his shift at 7 a.m., the busiest delivery day calls for a few extra hours on the clock. Hopefully by 5. We're, that's, that's the goal. Sometimes we run a little later, but that's what, that's what we're pushing for. Door to door, mailbox to mailbox, one step closer to spreading the Christmas spirit with his community.
In Chattanooga, Kelly McCarthy, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks to Kip Kaufman for letting us ride along. Kip also offered a bit of advice for everybody, all of us who send out the mail. He says, put the full address on the envelope as much as you can, the apartment number, suite number. He says that guarantees delivery and makes his job a whole lot easier. Yeah. And coming up on Eyewitness News at 6, it's history in the making. The first female firefighters ever hired will begin their duties soon. No special treatment. They do the exact same drills. They can pick up any of the guys and drag them out. Yeah, we'll talk about talk with the two women about their journey coming up next. And we're going to have a fairly nice day for tomorrow, but some rain coming up for at least part of the weekend. Then I'll tell you about Christmas Day on my seven-day forecast. I'm Chaplain Andrew McIntosh at Kunsan Air Base, Republic of Korea. I'd like to send out a warm holiday greetings to my family and friends, especially my wife Susan, son Daniel, and daughter Rachel in Tampa, Florida, as well as my family in Cleveland, Tennessee, and my friends across the state of Texas. God bless you all. Well, we're talking about history being made in Bradley County. The fire department is hiring its first ever female firefighters. Loretta Thompson and Michaela Ard are working hard to make history. They're training to be the first female firefighters there. They've been in fire school since October and are expected to graduate in mid January. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Kate Smith has their story. These two women are the first paid females for the Bradley County Fire Department. They hope to make an example for the future generations. Fire training continues for the Bradley County Fire Department's rookie class. This class has 10 members, including two female firefighters joining a historically all male crew. No special treatment. They do the exact same drills. They can pick up any of the guys and drag them out, carry them. Loretta Thompson has been volunteering with the department for a year, but recently decided she wanted to make this her career. Addicting, for lack of a better word. Um, it's, very, it's, a, it's a good physical challenge. Um, it's, it makes you feel good to make a difference. 
Michaela Ard served in the United States National Guard and wanted to continue her calling in helping others. I'm just here to help the community. I'm here to help people when they're having a really bad day. Firefighter training isn't easy. For 12 weeks, the duo has been going through real life scenarios, hazmat testing and medical training. I'm very proud. It's really humbling. Um, this, the training staff has been very supportive here and they've helped a lot. For them, being a female in a profession dominated by men isn't a problem. They want to be pushed as hard as any other new recruit. I'm pretty competitive, you know, so it's, it's not that they're guys. It's just that, you know, I want to be a lot of people at everything. Uh, female or male, I think uh, as long as you can do the job, it's just do it. And want to be recognized as Bradley County firefighters rather than the department's first female firefighters. If that's something you want to pursue, just just do it. Make it your goal. If you need help with getting there, ask somebody. Find somebody to help you with it and just go for it. Lieutenant Hicks says for anyone thinking about becoming a firefighter, male or female, it takes a special kind of person. And if there was any uncertainty about hiring these women, it quickly passed. Take either of them right now and put them on a truck with me and let them respond to any call we went on. The class will take their state exams on Friday and graduation is set for January 15th. In Bradley County, Kate Smith, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. There are a few volunteer female firefighters already working with the department, but Thompson and Ard will be the first paid on the staff. Congratulations to them and good luck. Coming up next on Eyewitness News at 6, winter has arrived, but it's not going to feel very winter-like over the next couple of days. Big question is, as we look at that beautiful picture downtown Chattanooga, will Santa need uh, windshield wipers this weekend? I guess, well, does he have a windshield? I don't know. We're going to let Paul Barra sort it all out when we come back. Well, the jet stream is going to do a little dance across the United States. It's going to do, have a big buckle, and that's going to bring the cold air down over the, uh, uh, the Rocky Mountains, but it's going to let the warm air just fly in off the Gulf Coast, all the way up into the Great Lakes where they could see some near-record temperatures 
coming up for this Christmas. So this Christmas is going to be very warm. We could easily approach 70 degrees on Christmas Day. Now all the showers, they're very light from Arkansas on uh, towards the west, mixed with a little bit of sleet in places, but generally just light rain showers. There's nothing happening around here except some high clouds are starting to stream a little bit closer to us, so we'll see some of those later on tonight. Now winds are out of the northwest to 10, they have died down, they were gusting over 20 earlier today. 54 in Athens and Cleveland, 51 in the city, while it's 55 Dalton, 52 Fort Payne, and 47 already out near Murphy. 63 and 39, the high and the low for today, so that's 63, that was way above what we were thinking was going to happen. But it was uh, worth it. It was a very nice day. 60 in Scottsboro, 61 in Trenton, Fort Payne, and Lafayette, while it was 62 in Dalton, and uh, 59 LJ, 56 in the Blue Ridge, and 62 Cleveland and Delano, also in the Red Bank, while Saudi Daisy was 60, and Ringgold was only 57 at Johnny Park's house, while it was 59 in Dayton, 59 in Spring City, and 59 all the way out to uh, Murphy, with uh, Colmont to add about 52, Jasper 57. Here's the latest Vipercast showing in some high and middle clouds spreading in, mainly high clouds for tonight. And then some breaks in the clouds for tomorrow. That little temperatures get back into the mid 50s. All the rain showers will be out to the west though. And then overnight, we're going to see some showers start to move in by Saturday morning. And some of it could be moderate rain, especially right along the border and northwards up into Tennessee. Then the rain showers fade out as the nighttime comes in and just some clouds and some sprinkles further off to the north. This is Sunday, Christmas morning at 7 o'clock, most of the rain off to the north. We'll see that southeasterly wind really pumping up the temperatures. All the rain will be on the other side of the Mississippi as the cold front gets closer and closer. The snow will be falling, a big snowstorm uh, for Christmas Eve across uh, much of the northern plains. So by Monday morning, we'll still see the flow of southerly air. That's going to keep the temperatures up. Now the best chance frame is going to be north of the Tennessee line, Georgia line. And then south, maybe a couple tenths of an inch of rain, but generally, once you get south of Dalton, it's going to be tough to get any type of rain coming up over the next four days. Uh, best chance, again, into Tennessee. So the pinpoint forecast for tomorrow, we'll call it partly cloudy. Some high clouds at 55 in Appison, and Resaca, you'll hit about 56. So for tonight, 32, just a few clouds late tonight. 56 tomorrow with a few scattered clouds, a nice day. 46 tomorrow night with the clouds thickening up, maybe a shower by dawn. Saturday, a very good chance for rain, but it will be light rain, especially out over Georgia. Maybe nothing in Georgia. It was 68 on Sunday, and Sunday is Christmas Day. It looks beautiful. 66 Monday, just a lot more clouds and some more showers off and on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Paul, thank you very much. Yeah. And in sports, we met the Mock's new football coach. Now we just need to meet his staff. It could be a lot of turnover from the Huseman years. Jill Jelnick is in for Paul Shaheen. She has that story and high school hoops when we come back.
Now that we've finally met the man who will be taking over the Mox football program, it's time now to find out who will be with him on the sideline. And considering a number of former UTC assistants followed Russ Huseman to Richmond, it looks like we'll have some fresh faces in Finley Stadium this season. Let's take a look. Arth confirmed at the press conference this Tuesday that his defensive coordinator for three years, Brandon Staley, will be joining the staff and then confirmed via Twitter bios today. Former Tennessee Tech offensive coordinator Justin Rascotti will make the move to the mocks. Brian Cochran, who served as Arth's recruiting coordinator at John Carroll, will be the new defensive line coach. The Mock's new offensive line coach will be Nick Hennessy, who has some NFL experience playing with the Buffalo Bills back in 2009. And then lastly, Matt Feeney will work with the linebackers. Feeney was a graduate assistant this past season with Arth. The new head coach also mentioned he hopes to keep a couple assistants from Huseman's staff and will try to finalize the rest of the staff as soon as possible. Meanwhile, over in the FBS, one of the latest college football controversies is that players across the country are choosing to sit out from their bowl games to prepare for the NFL draft. More specifically, that guy, LSU's star running back Leonard Fournette, as well as Stanford's Christian McCaffrey, along with numerous others, will not play with their team their final game of the season. Alabama head coach Nick Saban, who's preparing to face Washington in the college football playoff, doesn't blame the players at all and instead believes the new format is what's at fault. Well, you can't really blame the players. You know, I mean, we created this, okay? We created this. I, it used to be to go to the Rose Bowl was like when you played in the Big Ten, that was the ultimate of any experience that you could ever have. Those things don't exist anymore. All right, we have a playoff. Everybody's interested in the playoff. Nobody's interested in anything else. So now that that's trickled down to players, how can you blame the players for that? Some wise words from Coach Saban. Now, how about a little high school hoops? The Best of Preps basketball tournament continued today with CSAS taking on Saudi Daisy in the second round. The Lady Patriots jumped out to an early lead, forcing the Trojans to play catch up. Junior Lydia Hall finds a lane, takes it in herself. But then in transition, on the very next play, Patriots hustle down the court and Alma Justice is there for the easy bucket. Patriots go on to win this one 48 to 30 over Saudi Daisy. And then afterwards, the Central Purple Pounders took on the CSAS boys team. The Patriots had to find a way to stop this guy, Central's six foot seven senior McClendon Curtis. Look at him run down the court. If that's not intimidating, I don't know what is. But CSAS held their own from behind the arc. First, Mikkel Hamilton sinks the three to tie it at 9-all. And then shortly after, Jamel Dodds follows it up with another triple to give the Patriots the lead. CSAS goes on to win this one. That's two wins for them today, boys and girls. Hey, the best of preps tournament this time of year is just exciting. It it's is. a yeah. great holiday tradition yeah. here. Yeah. Jill, thank you for filling no in for Mr. Shaheen. Appreciate that. All right. Paul Barris, what about? Your evening out looks great tonight. Just enjoy it. It's going to be very pleasant with temperatures in the 60s earlier today. Now 49 to 39 by midnight and 32 to 36 when you wake up. Pretty much fair sky. Just some high clouds. I'm thinking mid-50s next couple of days. But Saturday, you are going to see some rain. Sunday, you're going to see on Christmas some very warm temperatures. Same thing for Monday and then showers Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Off and on all next week. Only good thing about that on Sunday, mm -hmm. the kids out on their brand new bicycles. Oh, well, they'll love it. <laughs> good <laughs> day for them. Mm -hmm. It's fun when it's nice and warm like that. And Thank for those Paul. of you who have asked, by the way, that Dolly Parton Christmas of Many Colors movie will be aired once again tomorrow night on Channel 3. Oh, man, I gotta watch that. that. Yeah. So mark your calendars tomorrow night. Thank you for joining us for Eyewitness News at 6. NBC News starts right now.